My last video on how Ada really isn't as reliable as a lot of people think has gotten some attention and not really in the way that I expected. I actually expected to be getting quite a bit of flack and I've been getting some private messages from people who agree with me. It's been interesting. Um, one of them is on a guy who... On a guy, Jesus. One of them is with a guy who I sort of regularly uh, corroborate with, regularly talk to. Um, him and I share pretty similar views in that Ada overall is a good language. Just certain things weren't really thought out, and that the 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 design of the language has just really stagnated because you can tell that the ARG just is way too focused on never, ever breaking anything, even in the name of the goals of the language, and despite... It, it, I, I don't need to get into it. Arguably, with the last video, you can say that I'm getting around the type system, that I'm violating the type system, and you can't expect any kind of safety in the language because of that. Well, actually, you you can still expect some safety, and I'll get a little C-sharp example at some point just to show how even though you're violating parts of it and simply can't check for parts of what I did, there are other parts that it can correctly handle. But this one, this one is how I want to show... I'm going to show you how dangling... Pointers are part of the design of the language. Yeah, this is not a bug. This is something that originally was not allowed and got introduced into the language by design. This will be fun. We have a really simple demo program, and the, the package that we'll cover is very simple as well. But the idea here is just that we have a variable that I'm calling uh, putter, pointer. Uh, it's just an access type to an integer. Now, I happen to be using an anonymous access. Know that this does not matter. Um, and I'll switch it out so that you can see that fact. This isn't a specific rule to anonymous access types. This just covers any access type whatsoever. And we're assigning it the value of whatever dangle is. And we'll, we'll get to that, of course. Now, after that's done, we'll go and put line, so, you know, writing to the console, uh, whatever the value is, and it's just an integer image with a dereference of this. This, as you can hopefully tell by the name, creates a dangling pointer, and I will show you that. But, uh, yeah, we'll get into here. Uh, I have a non-anonymous access type, the normal named access type, uh, already defined, just so that I can show you the, the switching around and how that doesn't matter. And we have a an exposed function called dangle. Now inside the body, there is a non-exposed, a real private, because um, it is confusing about that, uh, inner, that is what actually creates the dangling pointer, although there needs to be a little setup. So what we are specifically doing is creating a pointer that references this, and it escapes this scope, uh, which you would think it's not supposed to be able to do. Um, you could return the value of this just fine, and because it's a 
Now, Ada doesn't do value and reference types exactly. The rules for that are actually way more complicated than I think they should be. And there are benefits to not handling that automatically, depending on certain weird things. Uh, I really don't think it should do that. Um, like, part of me likes it, but then... Oh, there's so many weird rules that you have to keep track of if it's handled for you instead, and it's just easier to have it obvious. Um, but you could just copy the 42 when it's returned, and then, you, you know. But we're creating an actual access to that, which means we have a, a reference to that. And therein lies the problem. Uh, but let me show you real quick that we're not just simply... Re well, actually, let me run this. Uh, and I've already built this, so let's just run that. And, oh, well, I intended to show you just the single line and then whatever. But you can clearly see that... No, you can't because you saw the old code and you don't know if I'm changing things to, as a sleight of hand. Let me rebuild this. Uh, demo. Okay, so we have this with the single line and run it. You see we get the 42 that we expect. Nothing odd there. This, well, it's not that odd. You can, you, you know where the 42 came from. Some of you who know the language well are just screaming in your heads right now based on what you saw. Uh, so let me run this again, and you can see that it's 42, but then is suddenly zero. Uh, so clearly something is going on because this is the exact same call, it's the exact same variable, everything is exactly the same, but suddenly it's not the same value. And when you see those kinds of things, it's always one of two things. One is a concurrency problem where a value is being changed at different times. Um, you're able to diagnose that by running it over and over and over again and looking for those changes. Um, but considering we're not using any concurrency features, it literally has to be the other one, which is when you have a dangling pointer. Let me show you, let, let's walk through the code uh, first, just to get an idea of how this happens. And I'll show how Ada does have some safeguards that again is leads to people thinking that this is safer than it really is and feel good about the code, but Look, I have 13 lines on screen that implement a dangling pointer. Come on. So when we run the code, we have a call to dangler. Dangler initializes this value. It's an integer assigned 42, and it is aliased. All aliased means in Ida is that you want to be able to get the memory address of that value. It doesn't change any of the semantics otherwise. It just ensures that you can get a memory address for that value. Um, if that seems a little weird, it is because in most languages, you can just always get the memory address. Uh, there are this is actually something added as well and, and makes a lot of sense. There are advantages to not letting you uh, get memory addresses. And there are some, um, there are advantages to, to the optimizations and things that you can do, um, safety checks and whatnot that are possible uh, when you can guarantee that they will never uh, need the address of it. And, and by, um, explicitly saying you need to be able to take the address of something 
Uh, it's just one of those nice opt-in things. Um, it's very similar concept to how functional programmers advocate for things being immutable by default and you having to opt into them being mutable. There are advantages to it being immutable. Uh, same kind of idea. Uh, but then after that's assigned, we have a call to inner and we pass the value into inner. Yeah, hold up! Um, we have a call to inner and we pass the value into inner. And then whatever this evaluates to, we directly return. So now for inner, uh, we're just passing it the value and it's an input output. I'm not sure if this is important. I haven't played around with that part. Um, and then we would just return the integer access. Um, and then literally all we do inside of this is just return the, the access to it. What this does for those unfamiliar is just the referencing. Uh, if you're familiar with the C family of languages, it's just the little star before it. That's it's it's just add a syntax for that. Um, why people feel quite a bit safer normally is that if you just do this and then go to build it, that shouldn't be. Oh, because I didn't save it. Yeah, you can see, and this is the correct thing that it should say, that there's a non-local pointer cannot point to the local object. Uh, and that's because you have a clear situation of the the, the, the pointer to this uh, winds up going to the scope above it uh, and pointing to something inside of the function, which is clearly invalid. Um, And this function is what allows us to get around it, even though this function is literally just doing the same thing. So even though it's literally doing the same thing, let me actually phrase that ever so slightly differently, because it is literally doing the same thing. That means this is not a bug. This is not some kind of code exploit. This has to do with a language rule. Uh, now, before we get into the language rule, let me show how this is not something specific to named access types or anonymous access types or anything like that. Uh, so we return an access integer and just make uh, calls to dangle me and be ambiguous. Not oh, uh, that's because I need to change this one as well. Access integer. And you can see same thing. Uh, and just the same, you could change it here and it's not going to matter. Um, and we can change it here and it's not going to matter. And we got another one because I forgot to change it. And I'm going to roll. And you can see the same thing. Um, so yeah, dangling pointer. Uh, as for why this is zero, uh, this call, um, just so I can explain this real quick, uh, based on the way the um, all of this is resolved, you wind up. Uh, 
there's a stack frame created when this is called. There's another stack frame created when this is called. After this is called, so like basically right before this is returned, this stack frame is going to be torn down. This gets returned, and we go over to here where this happens. So right after this, uh, this stack frame is torn down. Now at the time, nothing replaces where this stack frame was. So the memory is still there. Uh, nothing's supposed to be using it, but everything, all of the values that were written to memory there are still there. And part of that stack frame is going to be uh, the, this, this value because this value uh, wound up being uh, returned. Um, actually, no, not because of that. It, it, just, it winds up being there regardless. Uh, but the thing is, is we immediately have another uh, stack frame that winds up being um, uh, created and disposed and what whatnot. And basically, as part of that, you wind up, for whatever reason, at that specific memory address, a zero was written. Um, now on your machine, depending on exactly what else you've got going on and uh, how your operating system handles um, this kind of stuff, you may get a different value there. Uh, I happen to get zero, but the the idea is that you're getting a different value because that spot in memory is being overridden, uh, which is a clear indicator of a dangling pointer. So I keep saying that there's a specific rule about Ada that allows this, uh, that this is a defect in the language itself, not in the compiler I'm using or anything like that. And the reason why I say that is the specific rule is located in this part of the Ada reference manual. Now, some of you may recognize where we are. 3.10.2, the operations of access types. Despite some of the bullshit that's said about this, it's really not that hard to understand. About 95% of the rules say the exact same kind of thing, uh, just about a different thing. Uh, the overwhelming majority of it is exactly the same basically. Um, I think a big reason why it gets the reputation that it does is something that is really hard to understand, that there are only a few people in the world that understand it. It has to do with how uh, there are a lot of rules, so it is very overwhelming. It is very um, visually overwhelming. It's visually a lot of information to go through to find the specific thing you are looking for and that makes it kind of intimidating um and also it appears so early on in the Ida reference manual so because of that a lot of people who really aren't super familiar with the language are looking at that trying to um understand parts of the language and this really is not something you need to understand early on uh, this really isn't even something you need to understand unless you're like really deep in the language um, trying to do some funky stuff or are implementing a compiler or something like that. Uh, this don't need to cover and because they're so new and this is so early in the reference manual they stumble upon it and are completely overwhelmed by what is being talked about. Uh, but the specific rule is down here, uh, 10.1 slash 3. Um, well, actually, pretty much the entire 10 thing. Uh, not not 10.4, but to, to, to past this point. Uh, there are little bits here and there that affect it, but the, the, this is the big one. Um, the accessibility level of the result of a function call is that of the master of the function call. So that is...
the thing that is result the thing that is the result of a function call so whatever the function call returns has to be the same accessibility level of whatever is calling that function that is how we were able to escape um which you would think were the, the rules around the access type uh, that is why it was caught in what I showed you was the reasonable thing to do, um, but was easily, very easily escaped with the call to inner. That's why I said the call to inner was what really allowed this. Um, but it is, it is dependent on two function calls. You cannot pull this off without the two function calls. Um, this approach. Uh, there is something I got to look into involving possible dangling pointers with uh, an access to a subroutine as well as to the internals of a record. Uh, neither of those are caused by this rule and I'm not sure whether the, those other things are bugs or not. Uh, like I said, I haven't looked into them. Um, but no, this is something that is actually allowed by the language. You have a designed in dangling pointer. Feeling good about the reliability of it yet? 